context list breath meditation as a topic that's appropriate for everybody. But as John Fung pointed out, it's not the case. To get the most out of it, you have to you have to be observant, inquisitive, not taking things for granted. Here it is, the breath is coming in, going out, and then it comes in, goes out again. And if you're not very sensitive, you say, well, there's not much here, let's move on to something else. You've got to sensitize yourself both to how the breath feels in the body and to how the mind relates to the breath. As John Lee points out, there are many levels of breath in the body. There's the in and out breath, and then there's the breath that runs through the nerves, and that saturates the whole body. And then there's a still breath. We tend to think of breath as being movement. But there is a still breath, and it's there all the time. You just have to tune your awareness into it. Now, as he points out, the, the breath that's most congenial, what gives the best results when you work with that, is the breath that goes through the nerves. You start out, as he says, with long breathing and short breathing, in, long, out, short, in, short, out, long to see what rhythm of in and out breathing feels good. But then you spend a lot of time investigating how the breath energy flows through the body. And you find a lot of seemingly contradictory things. Sometimes it feels like it's coming in from outside, and other times it feels like it's flowing from certain spots. It starts, say, at the tip of the sternum, the point about just above the navel, and the breath and energy radiates from those spots. Other times it feels like there's a column of energy. And breath comes in and out into that column from all directions. And you wonder why it is that you can experience the breath energy in so many different ways. We'll look into that. Because in some cases, it's because the breath is already flowing that way, and you just happen to run into it. This is how it feels today. In other cases, it has to do more with your perception. You change the perception, and the experience of the breath is going to change. Now, if you're inquisitive, you want to look into that, too. How is it that just an image in the mind will change the energy flow in the body? And how can you make the best use of that? After John Fuhrman passed away, I noticed that with a lot of his students began to fall away from the practice. But the ones who stuck with the practice were the ones who had ailments of one kind or another. And they discovered that by the way you breathe, You could ameliorate the symptoms of the different diseases they had. And they began to realize this is a necessary part of treating the body. Having that sense that this practice is necessary is what kept them with it. And the pains in the body, the constraints of their illnesses, forced them. But if you're wise, you don't have to be forced. Think of the Buddha's image of the different kinds of horses. There's the horse that all, he, all it has, has to do is hear you say, whip, and it will uh, do what you want it to do. There are other horses where you have to show them the whip. Then they'll do what you wanted them to do. Other horses see the whip, they, they don't think much of it, but you touch them with the whip. Other horses, you have to go into the flesh a little bit. 
But other horses, you have to go all the way into the bone. Why wait for the whip to go to the bone? Just knowing that there's a whip should be enough to make you want to obey. In other words, you realize that if you're going to find happiness in life, anything that's really secure, you've got to know your mind. And here the breath is already teaching us something interesting about the mind, the power of perception. Just the image you hold in mind. can change in experience. This applies, of course, not only to the breath, but then also to other things. It makes you stop and think. What would life be like if you had more control over your perceptions? Then you go back to the breath. What perceptions are really useful with the breath? One that I've found is that when you breathe out, don't have the perception that you're forcing the air out. You participate a little bit in the pulling of the air in as you breathe in. But as for the air going out, you don't have to force it out. Don't squeeze it out. Because when you squeeze the air out, you also tend to squeeze the energy in the nerves, which makes it impossible for a sense of fullness to, de to develop. So think of the nerves and all the blood vessels being full, 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 all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. And if the breath starts getting so long that it begins to feel like there's a squeeze, okay, stop. And you find that you start breathing in a rhythm that's long in, short out, long in, short out. And a greater and greater sense of fullness comes in the body. And then that will have an impact on the mind. There'll be a sense of floating. And the mind's interest in thinking about issues in the world outside will get a lot less traction. It just feels so good being right here. And if you haven't experienced that yet, know that it is possible. Keep that possibility in mind. And someday you may stomach, stumble across it and you say, oh yeah. This is what it's like when they say, you breathe in and out and there's a sense of fullness. So you begin to realize that okay, perception has an impact on the way you experience things, but also the experiences will have an impact on the way the mind perceives things. It goes back and forth. And when you have a back and forth relationship like that, that's something you've got to look into more deeply. What's going on here? Where does the original impulse come from? So here you are, investigating an old problem, what's called the mind-body problem. What is the relationship between the mind and the body? And instead of asking the question in the abstract, because when you get into the abstract, the issues just get further and further away from what the real issue is, which is how can you take that understanding of mind and body and use it to put an end to suffering. There's the belief that the body is just a dead lump, and then the mind is what invigorates it. But how can something that's totally metal have an impact on that dead lump? There's another theory that they're both kinds of energy. Lots of theories. But what you want to do is explore how does the mind relate to the body? How does the body relate to the mind? And how can you understand that relationship in a way that you can make the most use of it? And you see that the mind and the body meet at the breath. So as you get to know the relationship between the mind and the breath, that spreads out into the body. After all, if it weren't for the breath, you wouldn't be able to move the body. If it weren't for the breath, you wouldn't know what was going on in the body. There's something about this medium 
that sends impulses in one direction and back in the other direction? How does it do that? And where in there does the mind create suffering? It's all happening right here. And as long as you take an inquisitive attitude, you find that you get more and more interested in being right here. As John Fung used to say, there are two kinds of people coming to meditation. There's those who think too much and those who don't think enough. The ones who don't think enough just find that they want to rest, and they can rest. The ones who think too much are the ones who can't let themselves rest. They can't stay with the breath. They've got to figure things out in the abstract first. The proper way is to learn how to think through the breath. In other words, get in touch with the experience of the breathing, and then take that as your object of inquiry, the medium of inquiry. Learn how to ask questions, not in the abstract, but learn questions in the breath, in the experience of the breath. And you find it's a lot easier to stay here, and you get a lot more out of it. Those are not here just to rest in the breath, although we do need that. But once the mind is rested, you have to give it work to do. And the work is right here, in this process of fabrication that goes into the breathing. How does bodily fabrication relate to verbal fabrication? And how does that relate to mental fabrication? It's happening right here. And you learn the answers to those questions, not in the abstract, but being right here too. Noticing connections right here. Asking questions right here. So be inquisitive. That's how you get the most out of being right here. As the Buddha said, we can use concentration as a pleasant body, in other words, just a nice place to settle in. But we can also use it to develop mindfulness and alertness. And to figure out how it is that the mind can free itself of greed, aversion, and delusion. Now the breath is going to teach you those last two things only if the mind asks questions. You've got to figure out what are the right ways to ask the question, what are the right questions to ask, and what are the right ways of going about finding answers in the breath, in its, the mind's relationship to the breath. That's when the meditation gives its best results.